a verb. Plural, ports. Past tense, ported. Present tense, porting. Meaning, to transfer software from one machine to another. It's also the opening in the side of a ship for boarding or loading, but for the sake of my seasickness, I'll make the ship one next time. With the insane success of this little guy launching in 2017 and going on to sell over a hundred million units, it was a given with its perfect portability personality that we could finally experience so many games on the go that we never thought we were going to be able to. Red Dead Redemption, Skyrim, Near Automata. For the first time, we could play them all on the port and crap pub. Nintendo farted out this neon guy and now all of a sudden we can take a flight and play No Man's Sky. I'm done with rhyming, that's it. Now, at the end of the Switch's life, because we're at the end, it's done, it's over. What were the best ones that we got? First up, Doom and Doom Eternal. I mean, let's get one of the obvious ones out the way to save on this video's already way too long runtime. Doom and Doom Eternal were ported to the Switch by Panic Button, who to this day are to the Nintendo Switch porting scene that New York is to pizza. They're the best, mamma mia. In case you didn't know, when a game gets ported to the Switch, it's not Todd Howard lacing up his fancy shoes and going to work coding Skyrim. They hire a third party company to do the dirty work for them. They grant them full access to their game's build and they say, put that on a this thing, please. In Doom's case, it was panic button and oh boy, they ripped Head, crushed, slayed, it was great. Doom released on November 10th, 2017, which is just a few months after the console released, and it really set the bar for what this console could do and the expectation of ports in the future. It also sold like 80,000 units in its first week alone, which showed other third-party developers that not only can the Switch most likely handle your game if you put in the work, but there's money to be had here. We honestly owe more to the original Doom port than we realized. I mean, it runs at 360p and it's pretty ugly, but hey, call me a fraud. I'm just brown nosing for panic button. <laughs> Uh, yeah, before this video continues, I need to thank the sponsor, Marvel Snap, which a lot of you know, I am obsessed with card games and I have loved this game since it released. Take a look at my collection level. Oh, that's 3,601 because I've played this game entirely too much. Marvel Snap just added a new mode called Deadpool's Diner. This mode has its own tier collection tree and I've almost finished it already. I'm not kidding. I, I kind of love this game and I'm also kind of good. I'm also kind of cracked. <laughs> the rounds are only a few minutes long, which make it dangerous because you just want to play another one and another one. You get six turns per round and the goal is to just win two of the locations, have the highest combat score in each one. There's hundreds of different hero cards. The art on them are all fantastic. If you've already played the game, you know how it works, but the new Deadpool Dyna mode is cool because it uses bubs instead of cubes and the bubs can go up to the millions. You'll be gambling for millions. And when I say gambling, it's all in-game sillies. This game is completely free to play. Anyway, I could gush about this game all day. There's a ton of new things added to it. If you haven't played in a while, there's a welcome back bonus right now. All existing players that haven't logged in in the last 30 days get 500 gold, a premium mystery variant, a new card, and that's all until August 5th, so you gotta be quick. So don't miss the new Deadpool and Wolverine mode and all the limited rewards you can get. There's a link down below. It supports the channel. Go check out the game. As I said, it's free to play, and I really, really like it. Then just one week later, smack, bang, slice, Skyrim must be nice. Ah, I rhymed again. <laughs> I promised I wouldn't do that. The game of a thousand ports. It's on PlayStation, Xbox, your toaster, your grandma's fridge, and now it's on Switch. Skyrim was actually featured in all of the Nintendo Switch's original marketing. A lot of us remember that clip of the plane where he's playing it handheld. I've done that. I've done that with Skyrim. This was a big deal. Nintendo were coming out with a new handheld and you're telling me it's going to be able to play Puyo Puyo Tetris at launch? And also Skyrim? On top of that, it ran 
pretty well, which was a relief considering originally on PlayStation 3 it only had about 10 frames. But the Switch, a 900p resolution while docked, 720p resolution in handheld, and credit to Bethesda, even as recently as December 5th, this Skyrim Switch port is still getting patches and updates. Wolfenstein 2 dropped on Switch in June of 2018, and I really like this game. It's a lot of fun and it's a lot like Doom. I'm pretty sure it's even running on the same engine, which is no surprise that Bethesda asked Panic Button once again to do the port. And just like a Super Saiyan when he's almost and he comes back twice as strong, Panic Button seems to just get twice as good at their job every time they do it because yeah, it had even clearer visuals than Doom, which to be fair, is a pretty low bar. <laughs> Many people call me wise, talented, and smart. Mostly Kim. I'm pretty sure she's messing with me. But on April 1st, 2019, I made an April Fool's video that was me reacting to a fake Nintendo Direct that I made because I'm a little scared. Now at the time, none of the things I put in that Direct were real. And looking back on it now, I guess Kim was right because all of those things came true. Super Nintendo games, Persona 5 Royale, Metroid Prime 4 releasing in 2020. <laughs> Close enough. And then, Witcher 3. Funny enough, they revealed Witcher 3 coming to Switch just two months after I did it in my fake one. You're welcome. <laughs> to be honest, I didn't even actually think this was possible. I mean, this was a PlayStation 4 game of massive open world scope. How would they ever cram a game this beautiful on the Switch? Oh, okay. Yeah, now's probably a good time to talk about how a port to Switch actually works. In layman's terms, you take a game that's most likely 1080p and 60 frames, and you immediately say, well, no. And you cut back on those frames, you cut back on that resolution so that a game doesn't have to push the hardware as far. But on top of that, more than likely in a case like Witcher, you have to take out assets, lighting, shadows. They probably didn't have a choice with Witcher, to be honest. This is, for all intents and purposes, a miracle of a port. The fact that you can play this game on the go, on the Switch, is crazy to me. And for many people, this is playable, but for me, I always felt like they stripped out far too much detail. But to the port's favor, several months after it released, they did do a big update patch where they added new graphics settings. Much like on a PC, you could go in and tweak some things yourself, but sadly, you traded the blurry look for a very sharp and jagged look. Pick your poison, but it's still an amazing job nonetheless. I mentioned Persona 5 Royal back there. This was my most requested Switch port for a very long time. My first experience with Persona was playing through Persona 4 Golden on my Vita. To me, Persona has always been a handheld experience. It's something I want to play on the go, in bed, on the toilet. Frame rates don't really matter too much in this game. As long as you're getting 30 FPS, it's fine. And it runs at about 720p, which considering it's a cel-shaded, cartoony style of game and you spend most of the time reading, not really a huge deal. Back to a more impressive Nintendo Switch Switch port, you might have heard that Alien Isolation is the miracle port to end all miracle ports. The game plays at 1080p docked and runs at 30 FPS, but the thing that stands out here is that visually it actually looks better than the PlayStation 4 version, which at first makes no sense. Essentially, when they ported it to the Switch, they used a different kind of anti-aliasing. And the coolest thing about it is on the Switch with its veritable resolution, even when it drops down, it still has a clearer, nicer image than the PlayStation does at full resolution. This is a literal Jesus Christ walking on water, turning water into wine miracle. I mean, hallelujah. It's also worth mentioning that it's a similar situation with the Portal collection. It looks much nicer and cleaner than the 360 version. They're older games than Alien Isolation, so it's not as impressive, but being able to play them 1080p, 60 frames on the Switch is really nice. Dying Light is a game you never hear anybody ever talking about. And I don't know why, because it's actually a really good game. And it's also another miracle port on the Nintendo Switch. The Switch version even includes the multiplayer, the co-op, all DLC, no issues, no hiccups. It's just a really solid port. It's actually the only way I've ever played this game. And I don't feel like I missed out on anything playing it this way. Just a short one year and 10 days after Panic Button gave us Doom, they then gave us Warframe. And they worked their magic 
once again. This port is completely unbelievable. Just like your local coffee shop barista who starts making your hot oat milk latte the second you walk in the door because he knows what your basic ass gets by now. This is the hot 720p 30 FPS milk latte that we've come to expect from everything else in this video so far. It's clear, crisp, and downright beautiful in some of these locations. And the game itself is a very fast-paced action shooter online style game and it never skips a beat and still continuously supported to this day. And you want to talk about how good Panic Button is? When they got all of the files from the developers at Warframe, they're so good at optimizing and shrinking down games that they even found a way to make this game run better on PlayStation and Xbox. They just called up Warframe HQ and said, hey, you're doing a bad job, we fixed it for you. I mean, that is crazy. Just like with Warframe, I'm really sad we never got a physical release for Hellblade because once again, it's an incredible port. Before we look at the Switch version, let's get adjusted to the PlayStation 4 version. Did you see that? Yeah, and you see you see some of this. Okay, now you're ready. We're gonna switch to the Switch in three, two, just kidding. <laughs> this has been Switch the whole time. This is Switch. This is the, the Switch. The playable parts of this game look incredible for the console. They might be a little blurry at times, but it's the cutscenes that I find most impressive. The porting team for this one is Q-Lock. What they did was they took the real-time in-game cutscenes and they turned it into FMVs that then played on the Switch and bled perfectly back into the Switch's gameplay, which created really high-fidelity visuals for this game on the console. But the game is pretty cut scene heavy, so overall it created a really nice package. This video isn't about how much I love Nier Automata, it's not about how incredible the game itself is. This video is not even about how sweaty I am sitting here in the middle of summer in 95 degree weather trying to make a video with lights beating onto my face, it looks like I've literally just gone for a swim. No, this video is about how good the port of Nier Automata is on the Switch and how much I'm looking forward to taking a shower after this. Xbox One, PlayStation 4, their versions of Nier Automata ran the game at about 900p and it bounced between 40 to 60 FPS. And I know what a lot of you are thinking. Oh, the little baby Switch trying to handle that? It's probably gonna crumble and explode like wood when he sees that tiny little black dress, but no. <laughs> Ooh, what? Ooh. In docked mode, the Switch runs this game at 1080p. Now that's a heck of a port. Frames? Never mind. The frames are good, but yeah, I mean, it's 30 FPS. You get it. But this makes the Switch a better place than any to enjoy one of the greatest games of all time. Ripley's Believe It or Not, Dragon Quest XI was actually one of the very first games that was ever announced when the Switch was being called Nintendo NX. We knew we were getting Dragon Quest XI on it. That was in 2015. I was 25 at the time. That's what I look like at 25. It was going to be a definitive edition of the game called Dragon Quest XI-S elusive something. I believe the S in the title stood for Switch, but just like my mother, every time she told me she loved me, I'm probably lying. That's what I look like, remember? While the performance and visuals were definitely standouts here, it was more how much content was packed into our Switch version. Introducing both Japanese and English voice acting, a whole new 16-bit graphic mode, an option for orchestral music, and even expanded plot points. This was truly the definitive way of playing Dragon Quest XI. And then Dragon Quest XI-S released on PlayStation and Xbox. But it kept the S, so I hope PlayStation and Xbox players feel dirty. Because the S, well now that stands for our sloppy seconds. Hot tut! I always thought that releasing Overwatch on Switch in October of 2019 was too little too late. That's like announcing that you're gonna release GTA 5 on the Switch now for next year. I mean, we'd all still buy it, but where were you? And although even now, I feel like they could have sped up that release window a little bit, prospectively looking back, it's been five years. I'm sure they well and truly made their bag. Especially since merging that game into the sequel and turning it free to play, which oh, I'm just sure it made everybody that bought the game originally super happy. <laughs> 
I bought the game originally. All that junk aside, it was an insanely good port. It was a rock solid 30 FPS and visually it looked clean as anything. They even added gyro controls, which I really appreciated. Yeah, this is one of the best ports we got. I think it's probably about time we actually talked about a 60 FPS port and be done with all these 30s. They say 60 is the new 30, which is nice because I'm almost 40. You know, before the Steam Deck, before the A and Neo 7.2 Pro OLED Max U or whatever the hell is happening out there right now, probably the best place to play Diablo 3 was the the Switch. It targeted 60 FPS and it managed to hit that most of the time. A lot of people consider Diablo 3 to be one of, if not the best Switch port that we got. Rockstar has been very selective with ports on the Switch. They actually have one of the worst ports on the entire console, which is the GTA Trilogy. But then there's Red Dead and LA Noir. LA Noir was a solid port, not one of my favorites, but it was competent. It was ported by Virtua Studios and I don't think they quite figured out how to port a game like this to the console yet. And I mean, credit to them, they went on to do some of the best ports that we got on the console. They did Dark Souls, they did the Bioshock collection, they did XCOM, Starlink, Destroy All Humans, Near Automata, remember that one? They also did Dying Light, which as I said was awesome, and Disney Speedstorm, which runs really well on the console. In fact, I didn't even leave anything out in all of the ports that they did. That was all of the- Despite how awesome Virtua Studios did at all of those ports, when Rockstar decided it was time for Red Dead Redemption, they went with Double Eleven Studios. It might be my actual favorite port on the console from a technical standpoint, and the point that I love the game. Crystal clear, full HD, I mean that's it's exactly how I remember it. Mind-blowingly, Double Eleven Studios hadn't really done anything else for the Switch up to that point either. They did Minecraft Dungeons, which that's, that was fine, and then a couple Harry Potter games. But Rockstar was like, nah, you guys, and they crushed it. And then after that, they did Grounded, which... Yeah. Nintendo themselves have done a ton of Switch ports. I mean, you could look at the entire Wii U library being ported over to the console and all of those were great. Really weird if one of them wasn't. I mean, you can look at Mario Kart 8 Deluxe as just the shining example of all of these ports. It came over to the console, it ran at 1080p 60 frames, and at this point it has so much extra content from its maps to its characters. This was never a Wii U game. This just is a Switch game now. Although, I guess Mario 3D World got ported over and added in our whole extra game, Bowser's Fury, and it was better than the actual game being ported, so maybe that's the best Nintendo first party port. But I did want to take a special look at a special port from Nintendo, and that's Metroid Prime Remastered. You know, the term remaster often makes me think of just a game that was old and now it's being thrown onto a HD console and it's HD. This is more of a remake than a remaster, developed by Retro Studios, the same studios that went silent and spent eight years making Metroid Prime 4, which looks sick, so I mean, no, no judgment. But while making that game, they realized they could rebuild the original game in that new engine or whatever they've got going on. So they remade it from the ground up. I mean, if you look at the remaster and the original side by side, it's night and day difference between the two of them. They even improved the controls and added unlockable art. So it's the best version of the game. Now, who would have thought that a game released by a little company in 2016 and completely pissed off the entire world and had people screaming for their money Back would be the same game that in 2022 Switch players would happily pay full price for. This game has had so much added, chopped and changed that it's completely unrecognizable to when it launched. It's like the high school photo equivalent of me. What was that? Ooh. This small Switch cartridge literally put the whole world, the whole universe, the whole galaxy, multi-galaxies, straight onto your seven inch screen Switch. Hate me if you want, but Starfield couldn't figure out real time travel between the galaxies to the planets, and yet No Man's Sky is doing it on a console that's barely stronger than my toaster. And it does it well enough. The resolution is kind of all over the place and it employs a lot of tricks to compensate for the switch not blowing up and leveling your entire city and surrounding areas, but... 
you can do it. I have never played Kingdom Come Deliverance and I know literally nothing about it. But when I was looking on Reddit forums for games I might have missed that were good ports, a lot of people said this is by far the best one and holy shit. Yeah, it might be. I mean, I looked at comparisons between the Switch version and the PlayStation 5 version, and I'm starting to think I'm being rused. I mean, this can't be real. Take back everything I said in this video. This is the best looking Switch port. Apparently it runs at 20 FPS, but look at it. And crazy enough, this was ported by Saber Interactive, the same people that ported Witcher 3. So either they learned a lot from their experience porting Witcher 3 and found some crazy new ways of putting a game on the console, or they learned a lot from Witcher 3 and decided they did not want to hear anybody say their game looked blurry and decided those 10 frames, it's a worthy trade. They then went on to do World War Z. They found a way to slam that on this? Huh? I was honestly shocked to see this game come to the console. It's not like the game is anything too crazy looking. It's just, you know, when you get more than a hundred things on the screen, on a console like this, it gets bogged down. It starts to run bad, let alone thousands. Speaking of Saber Interactive, I changed my clothes. I ended up going down a rabbit hole and finding a ton more ports that I forgot about. I know when this video comes out, the top comments is gonna be, you forgot this incredible port. And I think that's great because there's so many that I can forget some. The rabbit hole I went down is Borderlands 3. <laughs> I mean, Huh? I'm pretty amazed this one came to the console. Being able to play this game portably is honestly the perfect way to play it. Instead of bringing over the assets the game already had and just downscaling the poly resolution on it, they straight up replaced the assets with a lot of just more cell shaded looking versions of them. Like look at these two rocks between the Switch version and the PlayStation 5 version. This is clearly a different asset, but leaning more heavily into the cell shadedness helps hide a lot of the imperfections that otherwise would have been there, making the Switch version kind of blurry, but pretty nice looking. I mean, that's the joy of something being cel-shaded. Wind Waker still looks good to this day. And that was on GameCube. You know what else was on GameCube? Don't worry about it. Borderlands 1 and 2 collection was also on Switch, but I mean, that's just less impressive than 3 at this point, so who cares? But the people that ported that collection was Turn Me Up Games. And I had never heard of Turn Me Up Games until today. And that's the rabbit hole I went down. Here's everything they ported to the console. And all of these ports are super impressive. It Takes Two, Tony Hawk 1 and 2, the remake, and Journey to the Savage Planet. All of those are very impressive games, both visually, but also in scope to bring to the console. They also brought over Zhao and Brothers Tale of Two Sons. Turn Me Up Games? Didn't know about you, but today I learned about you and now I appreciate you. It's almost like you can't miss. It's almost like you can miss one time. It does suck that one of the best Switch ports is surrounded in so much controversy and negativity. And while I do not in any way agree with or reflect the views of a certain individual involved here, it is worth appreciating what an incredible porting job that Shiver Entertainment did with Hogwarts Legacy. When it was announced that this game was coming to the console, I laughed the idea out of the room. I knew for sure this was going to be a steep situation where it would quietly go away and we'd never hear about it again. And if we ever did see a Switch port, I was excited to tear into it with how bad, buggy, and disgustingly gross visually it looked. But I have to eat massive owl here, not crow, owl, because they did it. It runs at 25, <laughs> let's be realistic, FPS. And the load times, my god. I'm playing this on a bus on the way to work. By the time the game loads in, I've already clocked in and worked half my shift. I do think, to this date, this is the most impressive port we've seen on the console. It's ugly. The frame rates aren't great. <laughs> Does it look like Kingdom Come? No. Does it play like Diablo 3? No. Both, all, all these games succeed in their own ways. And where Hogwarts succeeds, 
it exists. Even more impressive when on the flip side, the same team did Mortal Kombat 1. This isn't a video on the worst Switch ports, so that one's gonna have to wait. Kinda sad, because they also did Mortal Kombat 11, and that one was pretty good. We don't have time to go over all of them, but I'm gonna list some that all run and look great on the console. Like Metro Redux is a great FPS if you're a fan of Doom or Wolfenstein. Dark Souls might be locked at 30 FPS, but visually it's comparable with the PlayStation 4 version. Burnout Paradise is a rock solid 60 FPS racing game and one of the best ways to play it. Ori Will of the Wisps is an Xbox game and it runs better on the Switch than it does the Xbox One S. The Ark port is worth noting because it was awful in 2018. Then the devs went away, they scrapped the whole port, rebuilt it from the ground up, and now it's one of the best ones. Final Fantasy VII Crisis Core actually makes me think that Final Fantasy VII Remake and Rebirth could be on the Switch. They will probably be on the Switch too, if rumors are true. We got Assassin's Creed on here, we got Dragon's Dogma. Crisis used to be the bar back in the day for if you have a high-end PC or not. And now we have all three games Games on this tiny thing. And there's probably another hundred incredible Switch ports. I honestly can't talk about them all, but these are all the ones that stood out to me, the ones that I enjoyed the most and the ones that I spent the most time with over the last eight years. Other than Kingdom Come, I still have no idea what game that is. These are the ones to me that made the impossible possible. These incredible porting teams that spent weeks and weeks and months and months taking these awesome experiences and finding a way to have us be able to play them poorly. Audibly. I think it's worth taking a second to appreciate the magic that is quite literally on display here. And thank you for watching the video. If you liked it, like, comment, subscribe. If you want me to do worst ports, that one's gonna be a little bit more mean, but I could do it. <laughs> Let me know down below. I am so sweaty. I'm gonna go take a shower.